Uh, okay, so uh, for this part of the tutorial, we kind of uh, move into a slightly different direction, uh, not kind of introducing what NDN is, but rather introducing uh, how NDN is changing the universe uh, of application development, and kind of specifically uh, how you know, the concept of this NDN is. Uh, so you can see the quote, uh, kind of, it's not uh, just a fixing specific problem, uh, uh, and then trying to find a solution uh, to the problem, but rather uh, trying to develop the problem and solution at the same time. This kind of the quote from the cross and doors. And uh, kind of uh, when we go to NDN thinking or well, to, to develop NDN applications, uh, kind of what happens uh, if we name all the things? So it's kind of uh, moving to the direction of uh, Kind of with NDN, we have names, so like all those names are used by the application, the same names used by the, by the networking layer. Uh, the transfers layer is also kind of uh, kind of the naming. And um, so kind of we start, we need to think about the naming uh, and kind of do a lot of things related. And kind of uh, uh, the following uh, kind of slides will try to introduce uh, uh, how to think about the applications in a slightly different way, but like not uh, in terms of today's, uh, yeah, I'll get back to this thing, uh, not in terms of today's uh, kind of connections, you want to get the data, but you still need to think, oh, where I actually put this data, but rather just focus on kind of some, uh, some kind of a concept of data. And uh, we have a few parts, uh, kind of a little bit of uh, generic things, uh, some uh, Features that NDN provides to kind of enable this uh, naming everything, uh, uh, and then uh, we have a specific. Jeff will be talking about a specific example uh, of wiki, kind of not a specific example, but rather uh, mm, patterns that uh, we're trying to extract from kind of this uh, the previous NDN application development, and specifically from uh, from this uh, NDN uh, augmented reality application that Man briefly mentioned. And that Jeff and Peter will be talking kind of in more detail uh, as we go further in this program. Okay, so kind of what the NDN uh, can offer as part of the kind of specifically augmented reality application, but rather kind of in general, is a low latency. One thing is a low latency communication, and uh, kind of how it can be achieved because of the stack uh, of NDN is kind of. Uh, it's simplified. There's no more like multiple layers on top of the multiple layers. It's rather there's just the data. You can put that data directly uh, onto the link and that the data is being delivered. Uh, context dependent, name again. There is a something in the name that defines the context so the routers can do processing of, of this data of this request in a context specific way. Uh, high throughput and kind of, there's also uh, combined with this some kind of reverse CDNs is that the request uh, for the data doesn't have to go to kind of far away. Like if there's a multiple request for the same thing, then it can be, it can be aggregated. There's a bunch of caches that can exist in the network just because we have names, just because we have this uh, secure and data direct. Uh, heterogeneous wireless, again, this is the same uh, kind of concept uh, of naming data and we can kind of don't really care from where we get into data so we can use different types of links, we can use different uh, wireless uh, technologies at the same time, uh, we can utilize uh, some form of a broadcast medium and so forth. Uh, trust, uh, 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 we'll be, I'll be talking a little bit more about trust in the uh, uh, end of this uh, this tutorial and we have a bunch of uh, additional details in the second tutorial that we have in the afternoon. And IoT integration is kind of, right now the IoT ecosystem is usually and most of the IoT ecosystems is simply siloed to, to some place in the cloud versus uh, when we have naming everything, uh, like including the IoT, not even devices, but rather IoT things, temperature, lighting, and so forth, you can actually operate or think about the application development in terms of real things, not the controllers that can focus. And uh, you know, there's a the slides will be available later, so you can uh, read a little bit more details of uh, how this kind of this concept that the NDN hopefully uh, in solved in a much simpler way is uh, quite uh, problematic in IT infrastructure. So, what uh, for the 
during the development of Indian applications, we kind of would try to uh, think in, in a slightly different way. And uh, this uh, three bullets is effectively kind of some form of a conceptualization of, uh, of what we think, like how our ex effectively our experience with the Indian development and how we trying to kind of build the both uh, evolve the Indian protocols around then the kind of application development. So one the key thing that uh, what has happened is a uh, you know, we need to think about the application uh, in terms of data because that is the key enabler for all the things that uh, I just mentioned with uh, that NDN provides. So in order for application to be successful in NDN, it has to be about the data. Like, and you can think that there's everything can be can be data, like even some kind of request can be data. Uh, but you just need to think about it in, in that way. Uh, you don't have to completely redesign the application or redesign the approaches of the application, but rather uh, you should borrow the, at least the concept of uh, application development, some kind of a higher level APIs uh, as, as much as possible, uh, minus uh, you know, to still have uh, some form of uh, data centricity, data uh, conceptualization. And uh, what Jeff will be talking a little bit later is a, a few interesting application patterns that we kind of recognized and they kind of emerging uh, from the first two bullets effectively, when uh, and with, from NDN in general. Um, I think this is a little bit of repetition of uh, you know what uh, Len already mentioned uh, during the initial talk. To everything is data as soon as you can uh, conceptualize. Every, you know, in data items, now you can have security in data, and then you have the keys that are also data, and everything is floating in the network, hopefully stored in proper places, and the network can retrieve everything and facilitate all management and data retrieval of, of, of the um, uh, So this is a kind of a generalization of uh, um, augmented reality application that uh, we have been working and uh, just to highlight, there's a every, everything like the different elements of this application can be conceptualized uh, in, in terms of data. So I'm showing here like the name, content, uh, kind of location, orientation, identity, neighbors. Uh, so this kind of a concept, not necessarily you, know, you would think that they're data, but uh, you can think of them like as a data items that uh, I'm at this location, I'm producing some data that defines my context. And this is, uh, I think Lan mentioned word context. Uh, this is what uh, we actually start uh, thinking about this context in terms of the uh, AR application. Uh, another part of the context could be this uh, objects that you've been recognized uh, can exist in the video uh, and mm, like annotations of the objects uh, associated with the, uh, with the you know, stream that you're seeing, or some additional graphics element that can be put on top, or some content that you're downloading from uh, some external source can, can be also conceptualized as a uh, as a data, even though some of the things you traditionally may think as a service. Uh, and you can read what. Uh, so, kind of the good part that if you conceptualize everything is working, but there's still uh, a lot of questions that has to be answered, uh, not necessarily at NDN level, but rather uh, at the policy level. Uh, for example, what kind of what kind of data like exists in the system? Who owns the data? Uh, who can have access to the data? Like what kind of provenance properties has to exist in a kind of in this environment? And uh, especially is. Uh, uh, the concept of when exactly this data will be needed, uh, but whether it needs to be prefetched or it needs to be you know, pipeline to request for it, uh, uh, allow some form of uh, delay tolerance, or something need to be permanently stored, something don't need to be permanently stored. And, uh, I guess Jeff, uh, you probably better talk about this one, and I'll just uh, uh, skip a few slides. Uh, 
to give you like you can go back. Uh, so so this are a few patterns uh, in, that uh, in, emerged from the design of our application, and specifically uh, what we can find out. Uh, in order for the NDN application to actually utilize all the features of the NDN, uh, you know, NDN architecture and uh, take benefit of those applications, you need to think of, of, of design applications in uh, uh, some embrace in some in some way like host independent behavior. So you don't you have to stop thinking about the host, uh, but for, I mean, you still need to figure out where physically the data being produced, where the data being, being processed. But it's not necessarily about the where exactly you're getting it from or where exactly you're trying to process. But rather, there are items that have been produced somewhere, and it's a network's responsibility to figure out how to deliver your request to process data or how to figure out where to get the data from. Uh, embrace the multicast. It's in a similar fashion, uh, in similar idea, but a slightly different angle. Uh, you know, stop thinking about in point to point terms. But it's, don't do the connection. Like you go, oh, I need to do the connection, and then I'm downloading this over this specific connection. But this is, needs to be stopped. We need to think that there are multiple data that can be requested by multiple parties. Uh, the data exists in different places. And how to do that? That's a kind of slightly different question. There's a few libraries that provide some of the support. Uh, of course, there's a, a ton of work that needs to be done in, in the future. Uh, and what I mentioned, kind of transition to the storage. Uh, it, again, storage, you think this thing can be stored anywhere, everywhere, all the time, or you know, whether it's temporary storage like in, uh, in network caches, or it's more permanent like in a repository. Uh, communicate assertively, opportunistically. So this maybe more applies to kind of more contested environments where kind of the network connectivity not necessarily exists all the time, or you don't necessarily have a connectivity to the infrastructure. Where you really need to be more proactive in order to get data uh, from anywhere, from uh, different places, over the multicast uh, functionality. And uh, one thing that uh, is especially important is the concept of shared namespace. The fact that we're using names at different levels it it, it, it both impacts the application development and kind of uh, the application development uh, kind of impacts the how a network is being operated. And I'll actually leave uh, the rest of this presentation to Jeff. Yes. So I know there's a change in the very old picture of this narrow list. Yeah. So now uh, there's a transport layer with your personal point of view or it's official? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Which picture? In this slide deck or in the previous one? In this slide deck, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. on the right side, yeah. Transport and okay. There is a, a dashed line in there, so it's not necessarily a way, it's kind of trying to highlight it. There is a transport function, which is similar to. Yeah. I mean, the picture didn't change since like the consumer level APIs. It's still, I mean, you still need the transport function, but you don't want to all the applications have to implement interest data exchange. So you have to have some form of high level, but it's not necessarily completely delegated to the server. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up from where Alex left off uh, and introduce the, this AR application. Part of the, the reason for doing the tutorial in this format was to uh, um, so part of the uh, part of the reason to do the tutorial in this format is the mix in, in audience in terms of quite a bit of background in NVN versus um, no background. So we're trying to mix in new things that we're learning with some introduction to the principles. Um, a fair amount of the team is working on this augmented reality application and. Uh, what essentially is a reconceptualization of the web uh, of exchanging my local context in return for customized content on an ongoing basis. And so that's the example that we'll try to sew in and out of the different presentations as we go. 
Um, and one of the things to just keep in the back of your mind as you think about augmented reality is we're not exactly thinking about Pokemon Go. We're thinking about uh, how new forms of content will be overlaid on the real world. So in, in the back of our minds, in terms of content, even on the cinematic or photographic side, are things like multi-viewpoint television or volumetric imaging, subframe selection in high-resolution video. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you said content in, could you just, it, it sounds to me like the, the, the concept here is it's the, um, the user that's doing the customization as opposed to the public. Is that a fair statement? Not, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think the idea, so if you look kind of at the list of at this model, that application logic, and this is the extent, the full-day version of the tutorial would be to go a little further on this, but that application logic lives, could live on the edge, could live in uh, client code running in a sandbox, um, the equivalent of JavaScript on the web today. And the context that it's making uh, content choices based on um, includes things that are location orientation, identity, neighbors, and kind of explicitly interactive choices of the user are included here. So these are, this is publisher-created code that is making decisions about what content to display, and some of those decisions are based on user choice. It's, and the model is a little more oriented towards the user looking at multiple, at selecting multiple AR perspectives at the same time. It, it is more oriented towards user choice than, than some other models, but it's still publisher-created, uh, publisher-customized content. Uh, in this case. Um, so keep in the back of your mind that we are thinking about new forms of content that are inherently navigable that are overlaid on the real world. And when we talk about context, we are thinking about that context, location, orientation, and so on. But we're also thinking about real-time analysis of the scene that the user is in when they look through the mobile device. Um, and getting semantic information back about that scene, whether it's the 3D structure of the scene that's then used to make decisions about what type of environment you might be in, or um, machine learning, real-time machine learning based object detection or post detection or so on. It's being applied to say, how many people are there in this room? Are they sitting? Are they standing? And, and so on. And so a lot of the experimentation that we're doing is oriented around these types of content and context not maybe what we're thinking of um, in AR as it exists out in the world. So when we talk about the second point of NBN thinking is as borrowing what works from the existing internet, um, this shows up in a number of sort of different places in this particular application. Uh, we're imagining this sort of decentralized, interoperable uh, ecosystem of AR content. It's a lot like the web and has uh, relationship to a lot of the different technologies and approaches that are used in the, in the web. We're imagining apps being delivered to a mobile device um, in much the same way people are thinking about delivering unikernels or containers or even lighter weight things uh, for uh, on-demand services and a number of other things, even to the extent that names that might look a lot like URLs are where a user first uh, makes their kind of application level rendezvous uh, with a particular content experience. So all, all this to say, in, in summary, that uh, there are technical principles, uh, business decisions, and things that have worked well on the internet that we are trying to capture in the NBN thinking and in these applications. They just might not show up, uh, for example, in the kind of app store wall garden models that have followed after some of these original principles. So I'm going to walk you through very quickly a prototype of, uh, or a sketch of what we think of uh, when, what we think of when we're talking about AR, what we're building, and then talk briefly about these design principles and get into the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the talks. So uh, starting on the right with a, a real world scene that's observed by a mobile device. I don't know why it's the back of my head, Alex, but um, this is, so imagine an AR terminal, mobile phone, headset that's looking at a real world scene. We see that scene as raw context. So this is data that the mobile phone captures, wants to publish to the network, 
to be consumed by what? Um, consumed perhaps by things on the phone to make decisions about it, um, but also to be consumed by services at the edge, um, multiple services at the edge to turn that raw context, the odometry of the phone and the video, into deeper context that might describe uh, semantically what's in the scene, uh, what are they doing, estimates of what they're doing, and so on, and then returning that back to the, the phone. So we already have a couple different kinds of main data that are not about the phone consuming, but actually about the phone publishing, and then getting back in near real time, soft real time, uh, labeling and context information to that scene. That then the phone or the application logic on the phone might provide to content services at the edge that make decisions based on that content to suggest uh, context, uh, to make suggestions about what content might be used uh, in the next few frames or in the next 30 seconds or the next minute. And so, again, here we're already, instead of prefetching necessarily uh, the content that we want, we're providing names using something like a synchronization mechanism if this is done among multiple parties. Um, names that suggest content that might be available. So if you think down the road to what we can't get to in the presentation, how would you name these content offerings so that the uh, application logic could select uh, the content that it wanted based on some simple logic that goes from what it needs to what the names of available content are. And that's where the research is right now. What is the naming strategy that embeds the as much of the application logic as we can afford to uh, in the name, other stuff in metadata, and so on. And then that content is fetched back and overlaid on the scene. Um, so now to come back to this notion of, of design patterns, um, one of the reasons that I switched to my version of the slides it has some caveats and things in here. So these, these are not really software design patterns in the way that they're typically talked about. These are closer to the original, uh, not original, but uh, Christopher Alexander's use of the word patterns uh, in architecture in the built environment, which inspired some of the use of the word software uh, patterns in describing uh, software development strategies. And so they're, they're a little higher level and a little bit more just about trying to explain our experience in these interrelated ideas. And they're also familiar that they show up uh, in software design today. So the first one uh, is secure the data at its creation. This was actually last in our list, but as far as we can tell, it seems to be um, the basis, really, along with names, of how we get to the types of properties that we want in these applications. Um, so it's a fairly simple concept uh, where the work is that you'll hear a lot more about in the afternoon is in key granularity, how you manage all the keys that allow you to have expressive uh, ways of, as an application developer, deciding who gets to access what or who verifies what part of content at a time. Um, and for us as application developers at foregrounds, questions about who owns, what identities do we use in the application, how do those uh, identities relate to ownership and control over the data. Um, and in these designs, it seems to require that we think about retention, privacy, things very early uh, in the design in talking about the data model. So later on, uh, as you hear more, probably actually in the second half of the day, um, you can think back to this AR application and maybe give um, some thought to what the key design challenges are. Um, that we have many different types of identities, how we access the network, uh, what identity the application itself might use, what about the sandboxes inside that application, what about the personas that uh, users take on within a given application context, all those are different identities. And the point in NDN is that we can potentially those map those identities to, specific, to name certificates and build trust around the relationship between those names, the names of the certificates and the names of the data. So there'll be a lot of discussion later in the day. So what do, what do some of these more complex or 
potentially real-world naming strategies have in them. This is actually not from the AIR application. This is from a mobile health application, but the same structure sort of applies. Um, these hierarchical names in the designs that we've developed so far identify the ecosystem. They provide uh, one or more routes of trust. They identify different uh, entities like users or devices that exist in the system. Data sources that have relationships to those entities. In this case, they are um, tied to, in this case, those data sources are devices. Of course, there are those cryptographic identities that then have relationships to the trust anchor. Uh, data that's being published uh, and named according to its type, so you can't read it in the back. This is just fitness, physical activity, time location traces, uh, and so on. And then a bunch of keys that give granular control uh, over access to confidential data, which may or may not be needed in your application. And this, the structure of these names, um, and at least in some of the current name-based access control designs, will be the topic of uh, the afternoon. And so these are a lot of names to try to figure out. And part of, I think, where we are is, is to come up with uh, more conventions and more support from the libraries in terms of these um, things like key names that are derived from needs of the application and the data names. Uh, but once you have that, once you sort of have an initial design for what a namespace might look like, uh, it becomes easier to think about what, how to implement post-independent behavior relatively easily. And so this is not an unfamiliar pattern. This is why uh, cloud deployments work well. Um, but the specific technologies that are used in cloud deployments don't seem to work very well in mobile or intermittently connected hospital environments uh, and so on, uh, partially because of the mapping services that exist in IP uh, or that are required for IP, you know, from IP, the names and most independent elements. And so one of the kind of key design principles, if you will, or patterns uh, has been to focus on host independent behavior. So when you hear a little bit more uh, from Peter later about the AR application, you'll notice that uh, the edge is already conceived of as operating in multiple containers, um, a little bit behind the hood or under the hood. Uh, on the mobile, we separate the notion of the device from the application instance, from the browser instance, from the user identity, which makes the notion uh, of managing identity more complicated, but all these things are separating out the principles from the hosts. Um, and the, integra the integration of the application components is to make them only as coupled as they need to be and, and really uh, essentially for them to operate asynchronously and be coupled really by just achieving the deadlines that they need uh, that are needed by the other components. Um, another pattern or principle is in these designs to embrace the use of multi-categories <coughs> as a specific security implication uh, that I think I'll, I'll use to try to introduce this. So in the example that in the AR example that we're working on now, there's a consumer application that publishes video that's consumed by three edge services, one for object recognition, one for face recognition, one for pose recognition. Um, they return, of course, annotations back that are then used by client code to pick content to overlay on the scene. The, the nice thing about NDN is we can name, sign, encrypt this data once, publish it on the mobile device, consume it at multiple services, and have the interest be aggregated, because they share the same name, the interest, uh, within some time limits, uh, of what we can hold in a, in a cache, but assuming these are all sort of real time, we're able to aggregate the interests and only provide one piece of data from the phone for all of these requests. And so this is a great property for power consumption and so on, and we can imagine that allows us to grow an ecosystem of services that are operating on the user's context and providing many different options simultaneously, uh, whether the user is viewing them or not. This depends on consuming data that is the same data for all these services. And this takes us back to the question of what data-centric security means in this case. So in our example, these services are all in the same administrative domain. 
they can share encryption keys and so on. And so we can produce this data once, share the uh, uh, encryption keys with an authorized service with the encryption keys and allow it to encrypt this. Um, the challenge then becomes if we have multiple services that we may elect to uh, give different permissions to. And then we have to figure out, do we need to encrypt this data multiple times? Could we use a technique like attribute-based encryption to have one encrypted copy of the data that is usable by different services with the same attributes? What is the granularity of changing that key so we can decide in the service that accessed our data today, access it tomorrow, and so on? But once we're in this data-centric security mode and thinking in those terms, um, we can take a lot of advantage of NDN's uh, intrinsic multicast um, capability and caching. Okay. And in, in parallel with this is to take advantage of the opportunity to put storage anywhere. And storage of a particular kind, of course, at least at this point, that's imagined as just um, essentially name value stores, right? So whether it's a cache or a repo, um, once you have this NPN, this uh, immutable data object, name, content that's related to it, um, and corresponding signature, the place to find the key, uh, you can store it anywhere, and you can put storage anywhere in the application. And so the easiest sort of way to see it is even inside the application, we use this feature. So this, will, this, will, this is an uh, image that you'll see in Peter's presentation about the AR application. When we capture video, encode and segment it, uh, turn it into NVN packets. It goes in a cache uh, within the application. So the application manages retention and so on. And then the rest of the processes can go on doing what they do. And all of the interests for that data are served from this in-memory uh, storage that's owned by the application. And it allows the application to sort of forget about the process of serving that content and it makes it just as easy to provide real-time and historical data in the same framework. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I apologize for having a, a somewhat CDN shape of view of this, but uh, that's where I come from. Um, uh, I work at Aquan, and in a, um, a function of the CDN that has enormous interest to data publishers is uh, what they call curve, the ability to, after publication, withdraw permission to store and deliver the data. I can't quite talk through discussions here whether uh, that's a, a, a embedded you know, or sort of concept in this architecture or not. It looks like, like you said, publish and forget. And so is, the, is there ability to uh, to withdraw uh, permission to store and deliver data? It's a good question. You can always implement. I'm trying to, it's the first order principle question that I'm not sure, and we should have, and I may have okay, different so opinions. So, withdraw that characterization. Okay, so can you, if it's, can you build it? In, sure, absolutely, right? So, in this case, we're, we are probably, I don't know the specifics of this application, but at the application level, we're evicting stuff when we run out of memory, um, but we could just as easily evict it based on we don't want to provide this data after a certain period of time. Um, same thing yeah, is true. The difference from TPL, right? This is something where asynchronous. Sure. Publisher says, "Oh, I sent this out. I don't want to do it anymore. Right? I've got an update to this news page, um, and, uh, and if you go to this data object, I'm not going to do it. It's different. And I didn't know when I published the first thing that I was going to get this. So when I was going to get this. So that I would say that's not a feature of the architecture at this time. But we should may say so. Yeah, I would also add. Uh, I think I mentioned this. All the Indian data are immutable." So therefore, there's no such a concept of updating a package of objects. You actually publish a new new objects with a different name. That is a version number or time step. At least it will be different from your previous publication. So those are two separate things. You can publish new things, and you can have separate decision whether you want to make the history available or you actually want to revoke it. But that will be a different command. So, so many examples. I'm, uh, Video from my cell phone. I accidentally um, capture video of uh, you know uh, someone in my family who's undressed, 
I don't want that to go out publicly. I didn't know it was going to be out there in the first place. Uh, and so I want to do uh, after the fact. So I understand that every single piece of data you produce will have a unique name. I think it's a matter of how you do as a relocation. I don't think about our kind of never has that code, but I don't think it's difficult to implement. Yeah, I think it depends on what you mean. I mean, if the possibility of well-behaved services of banned conventions for not propagating that data is absolutely achievable. It doesn't exist in the current in the current library. And yeah, so do you sacrifice additional signing, or, or do you do search management if you're doing repos, just that I can make sure that if my certificate is offline, I can still retrieve and verify that the data object is correct. So I think let me repeat the question back just to make sure that uh, that I that I understand it. That in if you're storing the data in repos, uh, how do you ensure that the key, the certs are available to verify it? Um, that would have to be a function of the repo design or of the application, right? So if um, the application wants to ensure that the data that it's storing uh, that can be verified, then it would in the repo probably implement uh, a fetching routine to scan that scan the key locators that exist in each data packet, get the current certificates and store them as well, uh, for example. So it has to be implemented somewhere in the, in the system, but there's no reason that those certs would, couldn't be archived along with the data. And a lot of times we are in the libraries uh, automatically fetching those certificates under different circumstances anyway. So. I think of the item one comment. In NPN, the key is the search. It's another piece of packet with a given name. You want to search, send the interest that you send the request to fetch it. It's, so the system will find it for you. But the while following while you find the naming conventions and the packets. It's different from today. If I want to know if you have a key, I have no way how to get it. I'll ask the question um, all right, and so there's many more things that we can talk about. This is just to, to get you started thinking about this. Um, something that's came up, I think, become more clear even in everyday applications um, is that NDN offers a lot of benefit to applications or an underlying stack, uh, an underlying stack that uh, assertively attempts to communicate over all available media. And this is sort of clearest in cases like tactical networks and things where we're interested, or vehicular networks, um, where we're interested in getting data from wherever we can within the parameters of what applications might need or might try to prefetch. Um, and this is not so, uh, not so complicated of a, of a notion, right? Uh, but the interesting thing is that we can also have the network stack itself or the network participate in that sort of aggressive and opportunistic communication. And so you'll hear from Beishuan a little bit later today about uh, publisher mobility strategies that involve the network in supporting how interests reach a mobile producer of content, like an AR producer, um, when that mobile is, is moving around. So when we think about you know, what does it mean to communicate assertively, it doesn't just mean that the client code is um, trying all the different radios, and this is something that's, it is a nice feature of NDN, right? We can try many paths, we can get data uh, any way that we can, but also that the network can participate in uh, aggressively trying to provide connectivity for that device uh, because we're not so worried about connections between endpoints as trying to get data with certain names uh, from one place to another as the, as the creators of the network. Um, we're running short on time. The last point was the, that Alex made was the notion of sharing namespace updates uh, rather than connections. So the idea of sync as multi-party transport uh, is one that's increasingly important in thinking about these applications. And so in the AR browser case, uh, one example that you might think of is actually not just that we have many consumers for one publisher in the case of the, the mobile content, but we also may have many publishers of course, for many consumers, 
within the same namespace. So if we think about the namespace of this particular uh, scene, the real world scene, not just the image, there are different types of analysis that we can do on it. We can certainly analyze the components of the scene, break it down into its component parts, uh, maybe even go further to identify the brand of the racket, right, if you're uh, an advertising person. And all of that information may be provided across multiple services that are published into the same namespace. And so how do we do this many-to-many uh, -many communication? The proposal is that this is what sync is for. This is what the notion of uh, uh, namespace synchronization as transport is for. I'm not going to get into this too much in terms of time limits. I think this is the right tech report. Uh, there's a survey of different synchronization strategies uh, in this tech report. Picture. Um, and I think I'd also just take this time to point you to the website again. Uh, there are many other tutorials, uh, both video recordings and slides, that introduce things like sync security so far in more detail. We wanted to give a kind of higher level uh, set of ideas uh, today. So if we are naming, signing, optionally encrypting, we get these really uh, nice properties, and we'll try to provide uh, a little bit more detail as we go. So the next presentation is the on real-time communication over NDN and the status and uh, the use of the libraries that are there. Uh, more about what's happening with the libraries themselves to experiment with NDN. Case is a little bit how they're inspired by um, trying to think through a data-centric approach to applications. And we'll talk about publisher mobility, and then you can come back later uh, as far as data-centric security. If you download the slide deck on the web, you can figure out where I found these memes if you don't recognize them. And then additionally, uh, there are a couple of new papers in the MILCOM 2018 workshop that are nice sort of up-to-date summaries of both the NDN architecture and design patterns, uh, like types of things that we're starting to discuss here. Obviously, a big challenge in talking about patterns this early in the development of any technology, and so we would be really interested in pushback and discussion on them and also how they evolve uh, in terms of how we articulate them.